to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris. Tonight With, with me tonight is Jesse. Hello. Hey, I almost forgot to introduce you, Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, still here. <laughs> yeah, you do these fortnightly webcasts and sometimes things fall out of your head, you know, what can you say? So uh, before we get started, I just want to remind the people, if you like what uh, we are doing, if you like the show, if you enjoy the show, please click on subscribe or in either iTunes or down there in YouTube or wherever the subscribe button might be located right now. So please like the video, please subscribe. Um, so, Jesse, what have you been doing this week guitar-wise? Um, noodling around, as I usually do, uh, playing a little bit more acoustics, trying to get my uh, calluses really back in shape. They're getting there. And uh, working on some Hendrix, uh, Little Wing, and skimming a couple of other Hendrix, like kind of general Hendrix-isms. You know, the way he does hammer-on chords and that really legato, kind of free-form sort of rhythm, on it, especially on the slower stuff. It's really cool. And I see, like, that really influenced uh, Steve Ray Vaughn's playing, too. You can hear that. So I want to kind of get better at that. Cool. How, cool. How, what have you been doing? Well, uh, let's see. Two things, really. I've been working on this new rhythm uh, sort of pattern, if you will. It's new to me, I should say. Uh, I found it on an instructional YouTube video, and I posted the link in the show notes and in the comments below. Uh, well, the show description below, it'll it'll appear, so they just can check it out. It's a nice little rhythm in E that sort of takes you past the whole two-finger blues thing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking forward to, once I'm getting, once I'm good enough uh, at, at doing it, I'm looking forward to including it in some of our jam sessions in the future. Sweet. So I think it'll be a cool, it'll be a nice addition. And, of course, the other thing that I have been doing for the last less than 24 hours – actually, I got the I got it 24 hours ago pretty much right now uh, – is uh, my new amp, which you can sort of see in the back <laughs> there. It's the right above my thumb. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, I give it uh, a thumbs up. <laughs> I give it a thumbs up. You know, I've only uh, messed around with it very little bit, but I give it a thumbs up so far. It's a Fender Mustang 3 uh, version 2 V2 or whatever. Um, it's a modeling amp, and uh, it's been a lot of fun so far to mess around with it. I'm looking forward to getting into it. We'll talk more about it later in the show. And we'll also, um, maybe next show, we can even dissect it even further once I have a chance to actually mess around with it a little bit. So that's been my week, or my last day, I guess I should say. Awesome. <laughs> so, um, well, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, I guess we will not be doing this Fortnite in guitar history this time around, which is uh, perfectly fine. I've been slacking. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? <laughs> There's plenty of I, rock history. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> sure. Well, that's where I am, too. You know, I have to admit, uh, I, I, I got on Google and I said I searched today in guitar history. Not a whole lot came up. Um, if I actually put some effort into it, I probably would have found something. But I have to admit, I did take the lazy way out today. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <I'm>, folks. Yeah. <laughs> today, uh, this Fortnite in guitar history is when Chris got his Fender Mustang 3. <laughs> yes, that's right. It will go down in history as uh, a great day in guitardom, I'm sure. All right. Well, um, why don't we go ahead and talk a little bit about the uh, the shopping that led to the Mustang 3 back there. Uh, Jesse and I went to a local music shop in South Williamsport, Pennsylvania. On Black called. Friday. Black Friday, nonetheless. We were the only two people there for like the first half hour. I know. I felt a little bad about that. I was like, you know, this is Black Friday. It shouldn't just yeah. be like popping. Well, it's 10. It was like 10 a.m. That's true. And it's a small town. And, That's true. You know, so – I was actually hoping that would be the case so we could play a little louder than I otherwise would and noodle around a little bit. That's why I wanted to get there right when they opened. Because I yeah. figured, knowing the town, I figured it would just be us, right? And so um, I should start by saying that KNS is not paying us or sponsoring us in any way to uh, talk about them on this show. But I was more than pleased with our experience uh, at KNS Music, checking out amps, playing through all what they had, and just giving us the freedom to mess around. 
Yeah, and they're, I mean, they're cool guys, so it was, it was really nice. So shout out to, every, I was going to say Troy and Jeremiah, but actually the guy who helped us out, I don't remember his name. It's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> I'm so I was, sorry. <laughs> I was talking to him last night, even, and my, my memory is horrible when it comes to people's names. Like, uh, embarrassed. No. I would never be a good politician. <laughs> like, ever. I'd vote for I'd, you anyway, but you'd have one vote. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I can't remember people's names. I'm like, you know, my secretary of state. Oh, what's that person's name? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, it was great. Uh, they had an excellent amp selection. In fact, their amp selection is, uh, I would say, better than some of the larger stores I've been in. That's true. It really did. It was pretty varied. Yeah. They had uh, Vox and PV and Fender and they had some Marshall stuff there and Line 6. Um, trying to think of how I see an Epiphone in there. I can't remember. I don't think I saw any Epiphone amps. Definitely guitars. Yeah, definitely. Um, but you know they had a, a, they had more than just sort of like the, the tube amps or just the solid state. Right? They had everything in solid state. They had tube. They had modeling. Um, they had all different sizes. Mm-hmm. And what was nice is um, what we were able to do as I've gradu- gravitated towards the modeling amps in my decision making process. We were able to like dial up the fifty seven twin, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, model and then there was a twin there, and so we just played them both. And right. we said, you know, what's the difference between these two sounds? And I will, I know this is probably blasphemy for some people in guitar land. There wasn't that much of a difference. Yeah, it's true. Not at that volume anyway. It's really true. I mean, and and I, I think the same way, you know, I think um, it's a very specific thing because I don't want to, I don't want to make the, uh, the blanket claim that modelers sound just like tube amps, you know, whatever. I can just say that in that example, at that volume, in that space, it really was hard to tell the difference. And I couldn't say this tube amp sounds better than the modeler did. Yeah. And so there you go. There was a slight difference. Yeah, but it was it was small, and I don't think it was uh, the difference was worth the hundreds of dollars of difference in price. Between and the configuration was different too, so it's really hard to say if the difference wasn't just because it was a two by twelve cabinet versus the one by twelve, or even the model of speakers. Because I'm not familiar enough with the speakers they use in their actual twin versus the modeler. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so yeah, there there was a very slight difference, but again, as you say, and I, and I wouldn't classify it as better. No, you know no, that just, volume. Just different. Yeah, yeah, just just different. Now, you know, had we cranked the volume all the way up to eleven, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, deafened ourselves and everyone else in the uh, store, <laughs> <Neighborhood>. uh, maybe <laughs> we would have. We probably we probably would have heard a difference in the sounds. We would have driven the tubes to break up or whatever, and and maybe we would have heard a different sound. But I'm not playing that loud in my house. Right. Yeah, and I and, would never either. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I, you know, for the volume, and, and I think what we did uh, right in the process is we played these amps at the volume that we wanted to, I would play at my house. Right. Uh, which, you know, a lot of people in a store, they want to just crank it up or they want to turn it down really low because they're embarrassed about how they play. Right. <laughs> you know, and I, I'm in that camp, too. It's like, oh, my God, people were hearing me play today, you know. But, um, I, you know, I went ahead and turned it up louder. That was probably more comfortable for me um, than I normally would in a store. But I needed to hear what would it sound like in my room? What would it sound like at the level I would play it? Now, of course, it's going to sound different in my room because this room is where I play. Obviously, my answer back there. Um, is smaller than that store was. Right. Right. Uh, but I at least needed to hear that volume setting, if Absolutely. nothing else. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, I went with the front Defender. It has um, some really cool software. I have a Mustang One uh, V1, so I'm really looking forward to comparing uh, with the V2 um, to that Mustang One V1. But um, we played through the box models. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because that's really where I had settled on between the two. Was it going to be a Valvetronics, um, uh, one of the plus models, the newer models, or was it going to be the, the V2 Mustang models? And uh, boy, I think you summed it up quite um, well. I would have been happy with either. Yeah. Now, I like the Vox amp. It was it was nice. But boy, that the, that, the you know, they're so competitive. Um, actually, now I've been a, a PV fan in the, in the past. I don't want to say fan. I haven't had a lot of amps, you know, but I have a couple and they were PVs and, and I kind of wanted to like the Viper amp. That's the one that actually I didn't like as much as the other two. It seemed that sounds were kind of more similar to each other mm-hmm. than the uh, 
you know, the range wasn't quite as great as, as the other amps. So, I mean, certainly there was a lot of choices, you know, and, right. and honestly, we didn't, we kind of spot checked that one. So, I mean, I'd be fair to the PV, but um, because we played a few of them and, and we didn't really go through every one. Um, but then I do have the, the Viper first series. Um, the midline one was a 30 watt one, maybe 40. Anyway. And um, and it's kind of like that. It, you know, there's a lot of models there, but there there's a few that are kind of similar, you know, in the same vein. So I don't really, you know, it's good. But, yeah, the Fender's was a good choice. Yeah, for what I like to play, I thought the Fender was the uh, the choice. So I like to good play point. blues and, um, and classic rock, but mostly blues. And, uh, yeah, it just all those blues amps being there. And the Fender models are probably going to be better in the Fender amp. Right. That's yeah. a good point too about what what you want to play because I would say that if you're a metalhead, the PV is a good amp. <laughs> oh, <laughs> because absolutely. there's a lot of of metal models, and though to me, you know, they're sort of I, I categorize them as sort of similar um, to a metalhead. They'd probably be very different. I mean, you know, between a you know some Bogner and rectifier and you know you know all those different versions of high gain amplifiers that makes a difference to a metalhead. Um, I, but it's not so big of a deal to me. So, so yeah, that's true. Yeah, and uh, the Vox, I, you know, I think what made me choose the Mustang over the Vox ultimately was the, the Fender models mm-hmm. uh, and the availability of the software for um, the Fender Mustang. I'd already, I've had experience with the Fuse software. I knew what it could do. I knew what I was getting myself into by buying uh, a Mustang. So I think it was a little bit of familiarity, but the Vox was an outstanding amp. Yeah, uh, the Valtronics. I think I played the VT forty plus. Uh, I played a VT fifty uh, mm-hmm. there. They had that. We had an older model of that, and that was a fine amp. Nothing wrong with that amp at all. We even played through the AC fifteen, right? Which is a valve. Which is a you know, it's a tube amp. The real box. Yeah, and but then again, we were sitting there right in front of both the modeler and the AC fifteen, and when we had the modeler set to the AC fifteen setting, wow, it sounded great. Yeah, I thought that Vox modeler really nailed the Vox sound. It was, it was really nice. Yeah. Again, was it different? Sure. Sure. I mean, their speaker sizes were a little bit different, and there was a little bit difference. But was it, I mean, what, three or $400 difference? I don't think so. Yeah, yeah it's you know, true. Not, not for a hobbyist, at least, sitting in there. Uh, and I think when you're shopping for gear, when anybody's shopping for gear, I think one of the things they have to do is just be honest with themselves as to what are you doing with it? Yeah, you know, um, I don't need a four by twelve stack, <laughs> right? Your, you know, back you in the day, that was what people did. I mean, like you know, right. people would have their bedroom, and you could barely fit the amp in the bedroom. Maybe they'd have a half stack with just one four by twelve cab, but I mean, and then a blistering hundred watt amp. Which you figure, if this is in a bedroom, what's the percentage of tube use they're actually getting right. out of this hundred watt amp? Right. Should have bought now, a pig nose, you know. Yeah. Well, no, I tell you, the, the, the cool thing about the Valtronics, if anybody's still out there trying to decide between modeling amps, um, was that whole power setting. Yeah. Where you could dial down um, how much power you were um, getting out of the tubes. So it was a, it's almost like a master volume. Right. Kind of, you yeah. know. Um, and so I thought that was a really cool. And it, it was definitely a feature that was drawing me towards the, the Vox stuff. Yeah, that ability to have that, but like I said, ultimately I think it was the it was the Fender models and the familiarity um, with the Fuse software that I think drove me to the decision with the the Mustang, and I, I'm already happy with it. I'm looking forward to spending the next week and a half or so really getting into the software, really getting into the settings, looking at the community uh, Fuse community and seeing what's out there. I know there's a few um, well known model or presets already put up out there. Checking those out. Uh, and then hopefully for the next show, uh, I can speak more authoritatively about the, the Mustang 3 and uh, everything that it can and cannot do, you know, be honest. But I would like to say again, though, kudos to the folks at KNS. The service was top notch there. Yeah. Definitely. Excellent. Cool. Good shopping experience. Yeah, excellent shopping experience. <clears throat> We went out with the crazies on Black Friday. And we, <laughs> That's right. We came back alive. <laughs> you know? So uh, let's see. Uh, uh, the second topic for today's show we thought we'd talk about is 
we got this big winter storm hitting us now in central Pennsylvania. <laughs> Actually, no, it's it, it totally has basically missed us and it's hit eastern PA. But uh, we were supposed to get a lot of snow and I thought, you know what, this would be a good time to talk about winterization. Not of your car, of guitars. Guitar. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, so, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Let's, uh, what do you got to say? Well, um, it's a good idea once or twice a year. I usually do it twice a year to just kind of clean and condition your guitar anyway. Um, and before, right before winter hits or if you put it off during winter <laughs> is, is a good time because the air gets dry. Of course, you heat the indoors. The air doesn't hold as much moisture, so the relative humidity inside gets really low. I mean, when it's zero degrees outside and you heat to 65 or 70 inside, you'll get down to like, I don't know, 20% relative humidity. I mean, it's really dry. Um, guitars don't tend to like that. <laughs> um, and the worst, the more exposed wood uh, there is, the worse it is. So like the worst case scenario is something like, you know, an acoustic guitar where actually the whole inside is, is unfinished. And the wood is uh, is thin, you know, they're thin pieces. So it's usually best. And if you look in the music stores, they have uh, humidifiers going in the guitar rooms, you know. So that's really important in, in, uh, in acoustic instruments. Um, less so for cheaper ones because they tend to make them out of plywood, which is a little more robust, you know. It's not going to hurt as much. But even with electric guitars or the solid body where you have, you know, a hard finish, whether it's, you know, nitrocellulose or, or poly or whatever <clears> – <throat> Sometimes, well, I'm looking on your wall, and two of those three guitars <laughs> have um, rosewood or ebony fingerboards, and those are not finished, and so they all tend to dry out, um, particularly ebony. Rosewood is a little more oilier wood, and so it could uh, crack, you know, over time. And um, the Strat I see is uh, it has a finished maple fretboard, which is a little better. Although the back of some necks are unfinished, people like unfinished necks, or maybe an oil finish, which isn't quite as protective, can wear out, you know, uh, over time. So um, you want to clean it, okay? Usually with uh, depend the best thing usually is is a gentle like lemon oil or fretboard conditioner. You know they have uh, you know Diderio make all the string makers pretty much make some kind of fretboard conditioner. A lot of guitar manufacturers do. They should all be pretty good. I bet they're mostly the same stuff. Probably, um, yeah. And it's some kind of oil, lemon oil based. Um, clean the fretboard. Uh, wipe it down, you know, let it soak in a little bit and then wipe it off. There's all kinds of stuff out there on the Googles, <laughs> you know, and, and step by step how to do that. And that's good to do <clears throat> a couple times a year, but particularly uh, the beginning of winter. Um, and then there's probably you may need an adjustment of the truss rod as well. Maybe the action slightly because as the wood moves, um, expands, shrinks, whatever, um, it can change your action. So you might need to have the relief checked. Um, or check it yourself if you're good with that. Um, and the same with the action. Just make sure it plays okay. You may have to, you know, come spring, adjust it again as the moisture levels come up and the temperature changes again. Um, but that's a good thing to do. And that's mostly what what I would do for winterizing. A good thing to do is keep stuff in the case, <clears throat> you know, when you're not playing it. Of course, I like to have mine hanging on the wall. I see your do too. Yeah. It's nice to just reach up there and grab it. Exactly. <laughs> if it's in a case, I probably won't play it. I know that. You know. Uh, yeah, uh, you're right. The case is the best place. I mean, it's for protection and for you know the uh, elements, all those things. The case is the best. But week in, week out, every time we record a show, everyone sees my guitars behind me, and uh, I like I like having them on display. Uh, I like the fact that I can just grab it and play and. Yeah. If it's in a case, I probably would play it less. So it's true. So it's for to me, it's worth it. Uh, I did have to um, significantly adjust my neck on the um, telly. Mm -hmm. uh, I was playing it the other night and realized, wow, the action got really high. And so I took it in uh, to the shop that I got it from, and because they're willing to do all this stuff for it for free, so I figured, why well, let them have it? And I was going to put nines on it. Mm -hmm. and uh the strings are still in really good shape though and so i was kind of like oh, i don't really want to replace these strings mm -hmm. so they just adjusted the neck and they asked me how it played and i was like this plays great let's just you know let this ride for a while let these strings wear out a little bit maybe i'll put nines um on it uh when i have to replace those strings yeah yeah there's uh that it's good you know and i uh, i'm the same way i like to have things on stage just grabbable you know <laughs> and um 
one thing you can do if you if you do keep guitars in cases, uh, again, particularly with acoustics, is have some kind of um, humidor. I mean, there's aftermarket things that you can buy, um, especially for acoustics, where they have like little sponges that go inside the sound hole. Yep. Some that even block the sound hole. I forget the names of these things. Um, I've made a, a dozen of these um, homemade versions where you take old um, film canisters. Anybody remember film? <laughs> so photographic <laughs> film? But I have a bunch of these now. And you, you punch some holes in them and you put some sponge in there with a you know, damp sponge. And then you put it you know suspended in the sound hole and you stick it in the case and um, it keeps your guitar happier. Um, another thing you can do is if you have a colder room... Uh, it's actually a little better for your guitar if the room is colder because the difference in humidity isn't as, is great. It's not as dry because the air is colder, so it won't dry out your wood as much. But that's kind of unusual unless you have a basement or something. And I probably wouldn't put it in an attic where it's 30 degrees. <laughs> that, right, that's right. bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and actually, after having this uh, the neck adjusted on the telly uh, last night, I, I left the place thinking, geez, I'm going to go home and I'm going to check all the other next on my guitars. <laughs> then I got the call about the amp being in. I totally forgot about that. So uh, <laughs> maybe this weekend I'll um, spend some time um, checking over all my guitars and uh, making sure that everything is, is where it should be. Yeah. It's actually, like you said, it's good to do that like twice a year. Just give everything a once over, make sure um, everything's working like you like it to be. Yeah, you make a guitar afternoon, you know, you put some, uh, I don't know, some live concert up on your TV and you work with your guitars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not a bad way to spend an afternoon. Uh, it's the second best way. Best way, of course, would be playing the guitars. Of course, yeah. Obviously. But you got to work <laughs> on them so you can play them. Um, but yeah, so don't forget, uh, everyone, it's winter is here and it's definitely worth checking your guitars out to make sure that they are playing in their best possible way. We have run through both of our planned topics for this evening. Uh, unless Jesse, so I got, you... well, I got little stuff so I can show you. So this is a, um, a sure grip knob from, it's an Ibanez. They put them on a lot of Ibanez guitars, even mid price ones. Um, but they basically are, um, Kind of a bell top knob, but the knob, but then it has like a rubber ring. It's really easily easy to grip. Okay, I don't know if you ever saw this, but it's really cool. Yeah. And they're they're hard to get. Like you can buy them on eBay for like forty bucks for a set of knobs. Wow, <laughs> for a set of four. Um, yeah. I splurged and spent half that much. You know, getting them directly from China. You know, there's a you know a person who just always has a set up for sale. So I thought, okay, gotta have them. You know, so there it was. Cool. So is that this weekend's project? Um, actually, there's there's a two other projects. <laughs> um, one is um, I'm putting an amp. You can get little power amplifier circuit boards um, off of eBay. And they use little digital amplifiers. And they're not really hard or big power, like 20 or 30 watts. Um, but it's just a little circuit board that I'm installing inside a passive uh, speaker <laughs> so that I can make an active speaker and plug my modeling foot switch, you know, foot pedal into it. That's going to be my version of an amp for a while. That's going to be cool. I can't wait to see it. Yeah. And then the other project is I'm going to try to do that. We're going to see if I wreck this guitar. So I oh. have my, <laughs> my, my semi-hollow body Ibanez. You'll notice that these, um, the strap hole, the strap pin is like kind of the standard on a lot of semi-hollows. It's right in the back of the neck uh, area sure. where the neck heel is. I want it here, you know, on the horn, because this particular guitar, for those of you with audio only, it's a strat shaped guitar, but since it's a semi hollow body, it's hollow in here. So what I intend to do is fill this bit up with epoxy and then drill that and put a, a strap oh. pin there. So if it takes a dive and hits the floor, well, no, I didn't do it well. <laughs> That is a pretty intense uh, guitar maintenance project right yeah, there. Yeah, we're going to see what happens. <laughs> wow. How do you plan to get the, into the epoxy in the horn? Well, uh, drill the hole, and then I got the epoxy with the um, the syringe, the dual syringe. Mm -hmm. And you can get them with, like, the, both sides kind of go to one pipette, sort of. Yeah. And then inject it all up in there, and then tape over the hole, and then you leave it cure with the guitar upside down. Okay. And then it'll okay. just fill up that area. Then I'll drill it, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Interesting. Yeah. A bunch of people have actually asked about stuff like, you know, 335-type guitars, and um, and people have said, don't do it. <laughs> um, one guy actually took a um, 
cut a piece of wood that would fit the inside curve of the horn and then glued that in there working with, you know, through the hole and through the F holes to get this thing in there. Wow. That's way more effort than I wanted to spend. <laughs> That's a lot of effort. Yeah. yeah. So I actually found one guy who did the fill with epoxy thing and he's a luthier. He does, you know, guitar work and everything. And that's how he did it. Uh, I think okay. I found it by uh, looking for semi hollow epoxy strap pin or something. <laughs> so <laughs> one guy did it. So I'm going to be number two. We'll see. Wow. Yeah. That will be cool. Well, you'll have to bring that on the show and show <laughs> us the final product. We'll do it. Uh, yeah, even if it's not successful, you can point out where where things went south. <laughs> Here's where the horn blew out. <laughs> Here's where the project failed. Oh, wow. Or or if it worked, you know, we can say, hey, this is this is how it was done, and this is how you drill the hole. And uh, yeah, it'd be great because I bet there's we have probably quite a few listeners who would like to do something like that to a strat shaped semi hollow. Um, there you go. Yeah, that has that the the strap pin behind the neck like like yours does right now. And so. I would like for them to learn from my success or learn from my pain. One of the right. other, <laughs> right? And, and who knows? Maybe a viewer will. Uh, if you if you do fail at it, maybe a viewer will take pity and and uh, send you another Ivanez just like that. And say, Here, try again. You never know. <laughs> That's right. We are not above begging on this show. No, no. no. Send it along. <laughs> All right. Well. I think uh, I think your projects uh, serve as an appropriate show extender here for us <laughs> right. to fill in our lack That's of all I got. <laughs> That's, and I, I, honestly, I don't got much either. So <laughs> I believe we will go ahead and uh, end the show. Before we do, folks, uh, please click subscribe or like our video, even the ones that we don't prepare for well. Um, and let us know how we're doing by posting a comment or tweeting us at SST Show. Um, and just let us know what you think about the show, about guitars, about anything you want to talk about. All right. So until next time, boys and girls, just remember, keep picking and grinning. Good night. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 